This is Guardian Radio, your station for up-to-the-minute news, intelligent, interactive, and engaging conversation. 96.9 FM. You're now in the Central Zone, where we seek to be informative, inspirational, enlightening, and dynamic. But more importantly, we seek to be fair and balanced. There comes a time when the game tolerates no spectators, only players. There comes a time when we must recognize that our individual aspirations shape our collective destiny. There comes a time when getting in the game, despite the risks, despite the challenges, regardless of the cost, is simply the right thing to do. There comes a time when we must find our hearts, find our soul, and pursue our purpose for the greater good of all, for country, for humanity. There comes a time when we must manifest our true greatness, yes? There comes a time, and that time is now. So let's get down to the essentials. The essentials. Serious radio for serious people committed to advancing the national conversation. And good evening and welcome to Guardian Radio 96.9 FM. Welcome to The Essentials, The Reset. I am your host, Hubert Edwards, and it's certainly a pleasure and a privilege to be here with you this evening. Looking forward to having an engaging conversation. We're going to talk about an important issue, a matter which I think is very, very critical to the country, critical to us as individuals, critical to leadership, critical to just about everything uh, in, in our lives. And uh, I certainly would love for you to engage with us, to come in and have a conversation. Let's talk about it in a fundamental way. Let's talk about it in a way which is going to edify and lift up, not confuse or you know attach some sort of a agenda or isms or dogma you know let's keep an open mind and let's seek to uh, put things into perspective in such a way that we will advance ourselves and advance those who listen advance the national conversations as we say here on the essentials if you wish to join the number uh, the numbers are 3236232 3254316 Three two five four two five nine, and the text line is four two two four seven nine six. So, what is it about this important word I'm going to throw out to you this evening? What is it about this which keeps ringing in my mind? And I think if you were listening recently, ought to be or should be ringing in your mind also. And this word is trust. Trust. And where did I pick this up from? Last week, we dealt with the Prime Minister's uh, debate, the lecture, really, not a debate, lecture, on the National Development Plan. And you know, I gave some views on it. I've seen subsequent views. I've seen an article written by Kendia Deems. I've gone back and read the, 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 the document. And there's much to be said about it. You know, we could go one way or the next. I choose to just focus on a narrow set of um, issues. But for this evening, though we are returning to the actual document, I'm not going to, you know, go over the full thing. I'm just going to focus on the end uh, because I, I, I think there is a, there's an important, there's an important um, focus of some of the things which were outlined there. And for the most part, the ending of the speech, the ending of the lecture focused on the idea of trust. So the final segment of the lecture came on the, the ending of governance. And the prime minister said, this takes me to the final points I wish to make tonight, which relate to governance. We have already considered the limits and the possibilities of a national development plan and review the approaches of previous administrations that have resulted in our present context. 
I have set out the ideological approach of our administration. I have set out the ideological approach through a iteration of the values that guides us. And I have highlighted how our policy priorities detail in our blueprint for change show how we will approach the short, medium, and long-term needs of national development. Before I finish, I wish to address some issues of governance which I think will act as a break on national development unless we resolve them. I want you to pay close attention to that particular line. The Prime Minister says, before I finish, I wish to address some issues of governance, issues of running the country, issues of leadership, issues of the way policies are developed, issues of the way policies are implemented, issues of the way leadership interact with the populace, the constituents interact with the member of parliament, the ministers interact with the people, the way the public service interacts in terms of delivering services, the relationship between the private sector and the public sector, the relationship between the general public and those who lead at various levels. Governance. And he's saying that these are some important issues which I think will act as a break to national development. That means it's going to hold back national development. It's going to put a seal in a limitation. It's going to create a situation where we are going to be suboptimal in our performance, suboptimal in our achievements if these things are not resolved. The corollary to it is really, if we can crack these things, if we can crack the code on these issues, then obviously there is going to be greater possibilities for national development. It's going to open up greater opportunities for growth and development, greater opportunities for diversification, greater opportunities for working together as a community, as a society, in order to get to the place where we wish to get. So what are these things which need to be resolved? The Prime Minister says, principle among these is the issue of trust. And so that's where my word comes from. That's where this idea of us discussing this evening the matter of trust, because it keeps ringing. I keep, since the, 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 the Prime Minister delivered his, his lecture, I keep going back to that presentation, and I keep watching and looking and listening, not just to national leaders, but, you know, captains of industry, reading the newspaper, seeing the news, hearing the police giving important um, um, information, listening to reporters saying, but that wasn't reported. And I keep going back and forth between what the Prime Minister said and what I am observing. And he says, principle amongst these things is the issue of trust. We are at a stage in history where there is very little trust between the people and the government. This is true, not just for the Bahamas, but we can do something about it here. And that is perfectly so. I'm going to share some things um, which is mostly US-centric. But the research shows that, for example, the federal government, the United States government, or all levels of government within the United States, for example, is enjoying its lowest level of trust in many, 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 many decades. The interesting thing is, when measured and mapped, you see that trust has always been falling. Every single period that it has been mapped, this trust has been falling over the years. And so when we think about what is happening here in the Bahamas, I think the, the Prime Minister is perfectly right to identify 
and outline the fact that, yes, trust is at an uh, all-time low, maybe. But what is more important is that we seek to identify what it is. Just going back to the United States um, based on this measure, uh, when they, they did a measurement of a percentage over time of persons who actually express trust in government, in 1958, well, let's say around 1958 to 1970, that was up in the 77% percentile. Dropped off in the 70s to 80 decade, um, I saw some increase around the 90s, and then plummet again between 1990 and 2000, was up back sometime between 2000 and 2010, and between 2010 to 2020 or so, experienced its lowest level of being down to 15%, 17%, and at the end of 2020, climbing back to 20%. One of the lowest periods in the history of federal government in the United States, at least as measured between the period of 1958 to 2020. I suspect that if this was done in the Bahamas, there would be similar outcomes. Maybe not exactly the same because there, uh, there's a closer um, relationship and interaction with the with, 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 with leaders of government, there's also the narrowness of the population. And so you may find that there's a lot of noise in it uh, in, in terms of persons who support one um, party or the next or one administration or the next. And so you may you know, kind of find it average now. But I think over time there is evidence which suggests that the trust is winning. And at least if there isn't, if this isn't so, and we take the Prime Minister's word for it, someone who has greater experience certainly than I am, and greater exposure to the organs of the country, if he draws this conclusion, then you know I think we would be wise to at least latch on to this and ask the question, but why? He goes on to say that in our view, in our view, the lack of trust has arisen because of a couple of things, lack of transparency, lack of accountability, and lack of delivery. Three important things. Transparency, accountability, and delivery. So the people, it's not very clear to everyone. It's not clear enough to most what exactly is happening in government, in the relationship between government and the people. There needs to be more information, clearer information, better quality information, more timely information. We need to have information which is more fulsome and comprehensive. That must be what the whole idea of transparency speaks to. And then accountability is that persons are doing things, making mistakes or otherwise, you know, it may be mistake or deliberate, but things are not going as expected. The outcomes are different from what they ought to be, often in a negative way. But these persons are not being held accountable. The system is not disciplining them. There's nothing which is kind of creating those checks and balance in a substantive way in order to change behavior and guide a culture, a culture of accountability, a culture of transparency. That must be what the Prime Minister speaks of. And lack of delivery, very important, very fundamental. Because you can be transparent, you can be accountable, but the ability to deliver, to deliver on the things that you say you're going to deliver on, to deliver on the things which you ought to deliver on, to deliver on things which benefit and bring value and help and enhance and empower individuals within the society is always going to be fundamental to this issue of trust and credibility, yeah? It doesn't matter how much information you give me or the quality of the information. When the output and the result of the things that we are contemplating and looking at isn't there, and that is consistently the case, trust will be eroded. 
no matter how good you are. It doesn't matter how likable you are. It doesn't matter how relatable you are. It doesn't matter who you are and you know how long we've known you and all that sort of good stuff. If that is the case, some measure of trust is going to be eroded. Now, you may have a lot of goodwill pile up on the side, and that will be good for you. But sooner or later, that is going to be eroded. And so the Prime Minister identified these as things which must be resolved because if these are not resolved, he said, they're going to become breaks on national development. How important is it that this statement is made? The way I look at it is, having identified a problem, having spoken to it publicly, put it out there in the atmosphere, it must be akin to arresting yourself, committing yourself to the idea that these are the things that I will fix. And that's my interpretation, that the Prime Minister is going to really, really do these things. And this is a really interesting uh, situation, because even in the explanation of what these issues are to be resolved, a prime minister or any leader who is uttering these words literally sets himself up for greater scrutiny. Because in not doing these, if failed to do these, it would fall under the category of lack of delivery. And that too would therefore expose the potency, the potential for his trust, the trust that he or she may enjoy to be reduced. And so the Prime Minister goes on to say, you know, this is how we are going to do this. We're doing weekly press release and um, news reels and all of that sort of good stuff. We want ministers to give thoughtful answers to questions and we also want persons to be accountable, held accountable for the decisions and the action that they've taken. And then he goes on to indicate that we hope and expect that everyone in political life shares the same willingness to be held accountable, setting the bar at the right place. We want to be held accountable, and we hope that everyone else want to be held accountable because we are going to hold you accountable and um, we are inviting you to hold us accountable. And the whole idea of being held accountable, he enunciated, is key. It is a key component in building trust. In fact, Lack of accountability, especially undermines trust and confidence in government. When people see politicians transgress, transgressing, but with no apparent consequence, it's bad for democracy. We are determined to turn things around. Along with trust and accountability, we believe that, we, we, that when we truly deliver for the Bohemian people, when we make real the promises on which they gave us their vote, then trust can truly be rebuilt. We will not succeed at everything we do, and everything we do will not produce the benefits we anticipate, but we will continue to try and are confident that we will have more successes than not. And then he goes on to what I consider to be a very, very important part before we get into our own discussion. But none of it will work unless we work in partnership with the Bahamian people. Even though the country is crying out for change, it's often the case that people want to change but don't like to be changed. But if we work together, that's the important word there, if we work together, if every section of society is prepared to work together, that common loftier goal can come well within our reach. But it requires us to do more than just offer knee-jerk reactions to everyday events. Businesses and centers of learning must play their part. Churches and civic organizations can and should build and should actively support national development. And the members of the press 
who play such a valuable role in communicating information and shaping opinion, I encourage to also reach higher. National development needs us all to pull together, here's that word again, together, for the betterment of everyone. By working in partnership, we can spend the next 50 years building the kind of Bahamas that each of us know, knows in our heart is better. That's the ending of the Prime Minister's speech. I just thought I would go over that portion again because it, it's important. If it's really the least controversial aspect of it, or as the Prime Minister put it, the, most, the least provocative aspect of it, in, in a way where persons may figure, you know, somebody has been hit at. But it's provocative from this perspective that it causes us, it ought to cause us to start to think about the things that we need to do as a country in order to be better. There is a recognition that there isn't sufficient transparency. There isn't sufficient accountability and delivery isn't at the level where it ought to be, at least historically so. If you give the prime minister the benefit of the doubt and say, well, it's not me yet, but this is what I've observed up to now. And importantly, saying that these are so fundamental, if we do not resolve them, if we do not fix them, then they're going to be breaks, breaks on national development. But a big question that we have before us is really, how do we get to this level of trust that we so desire? Yes, if we are accountable. Yes, if we are transparent. Yes, if we deliver on an ongoing basis. There is going to be improvement. But is that it? Is that the end all? Is that all that is required in terms of rebuilding trust? And so I did a little bit of um, research and came up with a document which I found from my former place of um, employment, Deloitte. They have a lot of thought leadership information. And it says that building trust in government is imperative to government for governments to deliver on their various mission, such as policymaking, regulating markets, enforcing rules and compliance, and protecting citizens. So if there is ever a view that the policymaking is weak or flawed, that the markets are not being regulated. Obviously, this is a big market. Look, but certainly at our level, if we're not taking care of the, the banks, if we're not regulating commerce, if we're not regulating industry, if government is not doing the things which are going to protect the interests of the regular citizens, then that is going to have an adverse impact, adverse influence on trust. And this whole idea of rebuilding trust in government is not an absolute thing. It's not simply saying, hey, I am transparent. Hey, we are being held accountable. Hey, here is the delivery. A huge portion of this is about perception. Are you perceived as being trustworthy? Are you perceived to be accountable? And so when government sets out on the path of doing this. This document says, rebuilding trust in government depends as much on the perceptions of citizens as the capability of the government. So it's not simply in the doing, but is in how the citizenship views or perceive the competence, the capability, that which is delivered. That is to say that government must work to both increase the perception, so you have to work with the people, of its trustworthiness, as well as the organizational capabilities to actually deliver service, product, and experience worthy of trust. So the message here would be, don't simply focus on delivering on the promises, delivering on the projects and the initiatives but also pay very, very close attention, very careful attention to how you manage the perception of the public. Because for whatsoever reason, wrong or right, this is a perception, so you may, you may see it as being irrational. You may 
on objective analysis can't find it to be justified. But as long as the perception goes against you, you're going to have a problem. In the Bahamas, one of the revolving theme of past administrations has always been when asked about, you know, well, why is it that the public sees you in a particular way or, or view your performance in a particular way? A very common response has always been, our public relations have not been good enough. We did some things. We did a lot of things, but we didn't tell the people what we've been doing. We didn't give them enough information. Well, this is what this is speaking to. By admitting that, it's an admission to, we allow a particular perception which is different from the reality. And, and this is their proposition. I'm not saying that it's actually the case. But they're making the point that we allow a perception which is different from the reality as we know it to fester, to voice, and to harden because we didn't do a good enough job having that conversation. And it's an, it's, it's, it's in a, it's an interesting and very um, um, complex admission from my perspective because in this whole transaction of the relationship between government and the populace, that conversation should always be up front, not at the back end. So the extent to which the PR thrust is necessary and because it's missing, there was a lack of information, tells in and of itself a story, a very powerful and potent story right there. And so the message to be unwrapped from that is that governments, administration, need to spend time, valuable time, not see this as uh, you know, a by-the-way thing, but as being fundamental and foundational in this whole idea of running and managing the country and to achieve what the prime minister said, to build trust. Because you have to grapple with the perception. So how can you build and sustain this trust? Where are we now that the Prime Minister has thrown out that charge to obviously the persons within its administration? But because trust is not a one-way street, it has to be going both ways. Where is it that we are going to find the tools where are we going to find the input, the element, the factors to create this trust? And I'm proposing to you, drawing from the research that I did, that there are four areas which are important to focus on. Four important areas. One, humanity. Two, we talked about that before, transparency. Three, Capability, and the fourth one is reliability. So, humanity. There has to be some heart in this. Everything has a heart. Everything has to touch the emotion. It has to consider the human being in the whole transaction. The humanness of the situation, of the circumstance, of the delivery, of the interaction. It has to take into consideration the transparency. I do, are you giving me the full story? Do I, do I believe that you're giving me the full story? Is there additional information? Am I getting the best quality information available at the time? Or was it delay? Was it fudge? Uh, is there more to come? Uh, did you hide some? What is it? Why am I not understanding? Is it because I can't understand? Or is it because you're not enabling and facilitating and empowering my understanding? And then there is a capability, the ability to do. You must, uh, you, you must be capable of doing stuff. Because there is also going to be that perception hanging there. You know, how do we perceive you as being a capable purveyor of whatsoever it is that you set out to do? 
So these are important areas that the government must focus on if it's going to deal with this thing of trust. So trust, it is said, looks at this idea or this um, coming together of competence and intent. Competence and intent. And the intention goes to the humanity I just spoke about, and it goes to the transparency. And then the competence goes to the capability and the reliability. So let me say that again. So if you picture this um, Chinese thing of the yin and the yang, the black part and the white part, which says even though they're separate, they're part of the same thing. They're equal. They're opposite but equal and important for the whole to be whole. So we're proposing that trust needs intent and competence in order for it to be wholesome. And then you break down intent and you look at the humanity within the whole process. Uh, you know, what is it that you plan on doing? And how that affects me as an individual, how does it affect you as an individual? And the transparency associated with that. And then we look at your competence and we say, you know, how capable you are and how reliable. Because, you know, some people are very, very competent, but they don't do it often or consistently. No one again, no one again. That takes away from the trust. If I know that you can do something and then I notice that you're doing it only half stepping, I'm not going to trust you. I know what you're capable of. Or even worse, even worse, you may not have the same level of competence that I perceive you to have. But that perception dictates my conclusion at the end of the day. So I perceive you to be someone who has great capability or I perceive you to be someone who is incapable. The opposite may be true, but that's my perception nonetheless that is going to, at the end of the day, affect the way the trust relationship, the trust interaction works between both of us. And that's why it's important to manage that perception. Very, very important to manage that perception. So let's kind of drill down into what we mean by these issues of humanity, reliability, capability, and transparency. So firstly, on the humanity side, the humanity side addresses the perception that government genuinely cares for its constituents, experience and well-being by demonstrating empathy, kindness, and fairness. Let me go back over that. The humanity aspect, remember there, there, there are these four pillars which works into developing this trust. On one side, there is intent, and flowing out of intent is the humanity and transparency. And on the other side, there is the competence, and flowing out of that is capability and reliability. On the humanity side, it says, it, 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 it speaks to the perception that government genuinely, genuinely, cares for its constituents' experience and well-being by demonstrating empathy, kindness, and fairness. Empathy. Do you understand? Do you feel? Can you demonstrate the ability to walk beside me on my journey? Can you make that connection between where I am as an individual, where we are as a family, where we are as a community, and where you might be. Is there a difference in that you cannot connect with the emotional challenges that we are having? You cannot connect or empathize with the financial strain that we are having. You cannot connect or understand with why we live and operate and behave the way we do because you don't have that level of 
empathy. You, it's just not possible for you to do that. Even though in some instances, you ought to be able to because you, know, you came from exactly where we are. And so because of that, the perception will be, well, you know, something is wrong here. Something is not aligned. And that is going to affect your trust relationship between you and the constituents. Are you kind? Are you doing this out of kindness and out of fairness? Uh, when we look across the, 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 the landscape and we see how resources are kind of shared out, is, is it equitable? Do I have a fair shake at achieving the same thing that the other person is achieving or that person is only getting ahead because he is being significantly enabled in an unfair way? And by unfair, I mean that because, you know, we're dealing with a patrimony and everybody should have a shake at that. And the fact that some grouping um, in the bar, say we refer to that as special interest, because of those groupings, Persons will cry foul. So is there kindness and is there fairness? So really, based on the research, based on the studies, constituents actually expect their member parliaments, their leaders, their ministers, uh, heads of government to be kind. Not to uh, be, you know, kind of robotic, in the way they do things, they, they actually expect a display of these important human elements, human characteristics, and therefore conveying an emotional connection with the individuals. What of transparency? This indicates that government openly shares information, motives and choices relate to policy, budget, and program decision in straightforward language. Let me say that again. That the government openly shares information, openly share motive. Why are we doing this? So I can give you all of the information, but I may not tell you why I'm motivated to do it. But the transparency requires that. Calls for the motives to, to be laid bare. It also calls for a if you will, uh, a comparison between the choices. So we have the option of choosing A or B. Here is why we went with B. So the choices between related policies needs to be very clear. And many times we see this playing out in real life, here in the Bahamas and in many other places around the world. And you ask yourself, why was that decision taken? Because uh, at your level and based on the information that you have, that just don't make no sense. That or, or, or at least it doesn't seem to make sense. Transparency dictates that that becomes clear, that we openly have a discourse around we're faced with four options. Option A is going to lead us to hell and back. Option B is going to take us halfway there, and that is still not good. Option C and D are our two best choices. But we only can go one way, one path. And here is the reason we are going with D, because it, while maybe challenging in the first instance, delivers the greatest long-term sustainable set of results that is going to inure for the country, for the citizens, for you. That is Transparency 101 at its best, really drilling down and eliminating any possibility of ambiguity as to why it was chosen, but also in the process demonstrating, demonstrating a commitment to telling you, giving you the reason, and demonstrating that it is in the best interest of all involved or most persons involved, but never ever all, but you know, for most persons involved. Being transparent in terms of budget, being transparent in terms of program decision, and of course, being straightforward in the language with which it is explained. You know, these things, especially at um, policy level, 
government talking about economics and stuff. If you want to, it can become very convoluted. But then again, the whole thing of building trust comes back to who am I speaking to? If I'm, am I actually communicating? Am I doing this in such a way that the ordinary Joe on the street understands? So straightforward language. No run about, no fluff, no niceties. Just simply say it in the way it ought to be said. Of course, with sensitivity and uh, you know, in, a, in a way that's always going to be respectful. But it has to be said. And then we look at the other side, which is now the competence side. And we have the capability. So capability reflects the belief that the government can create high-quality programs and services and has the ability to meet expectations effectively. Reflects the belief that the government can create high-quality programs and services and has the ability to meet expectations effectively. This is a very important one. Obviously, whatsoever the program or initiative that the, the public is expecting, whatsoever goods or services the government is delivering, the public is always going to expect the best. If it is portable water, it needs to be persons by default expect that to be the best quality water available. If it is an educational program, if it is school system, persons are anticipating the best. Now, experience may say, well, that isn't what you have gotten and likely to not get. But the expectation is always going to be that there is going to be a delivery of the best quality programs and services and you have the ability to meet them effectively. It ties in, importantly, with what resources does the government have? How much can the government truly afford? At what level of funding is the government fully optimized to deliver at the highest level? And does it have those resources? So this goes back also and tie into this whole idea of being transparent. Because in the pronouncement, in delivering, in interacting with the public, there need to be an understanding of exactly where we are, why we are there, how we are going to move forward, and the limitation that that is going to create in this moment. Now, I say that, but I want to qualify it by saying this. An important role, from my perspective, that government plays is injecting enthusiasm and optimism within the country, in the country, in the economy. I do not anticipate, I do not expect a government, an administration, to talk down the fortunes, the, 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 the fate of a country. I do not expect that. As a matter of fact, I believe that a individual who does that, who is going to be leading and speaking on an ongoing basis negatively of the country, is effectively disqualifying him or herself. There is no question about that. If you are put in a position to lead to a better place, to, res to, to realize better things, then obviously we will not want to always hear the negatives. However, there is a balance to be struck between the optimism and the realism. Because at some point in time, if you create an overly optimistic expectation, which you're unable to deliver on, and this goes for leadership, I think, at any level. It goes for interaction between uh, individuals, relationships, um, family, friends. Uh, you know, if you are being overly optimistic and creating an expectation beyond your capacity to deliver, then it's going to impact your trust because it's going to have a negative effect on your capability to deliver. And as we have heard before in this discussion so far, 
the ability to actually deliver and deliver at high level is fundamental to this whole idea of building trust. And then we come to this important matter of real reliability. A re reliability will show that government can consistently and depend dependably deliver high quality programs, services, and experience to constituents across platforms and geographies. So in the Bahamas, it would be, you know, in New Providence and in, in the Family Islands, the government will be able to demonstrate that. High quality. Can they do that? But not just do it, but do it consistently. And if these things are in play, if these things are in place, then obviously over time, there is going to be a trust. Credit. There is going to be value created. You're going to develop goodwill and therefore you're going to be in a better position. So the prime minister says that trust needs to be rebuilt. If that is the case, and obviously by making that pronouncement, it's an indication of an embarkation on a journey to do exactly that, then these are some of the factors we should anticipate will be present in that rebuilding, must be present in that whole rebuilding. And I believe, I certainly believe, and this is the reason I came back to it, and it's the reason why I have been thinking and reflecting quietly and watching how things are going to be rolling out over the next couple of months and weeks and years. Because having highlighted this and draw our awareness to the fact, not that it was something which wasn't known, but drawing attention to it suggests that effort is going to be expended because energy goes where attention flows. But that fix, that fix which we anticipate, that rebuilding, the important rebuilding, the necessary rebuilding, the one which, if it doesn't happen, is going to create limitation for our national um, growth and development, which we do not want. So we are in the corner. We are on the side of pushing for this to happen and this to happen in a structured, disciplined, pragmatic, but value-creating way. It must involve these things that we just discussed. Attention must be placed on intent and competence. And as you drill down in this idea of intent, you have to look at the humanity of the situation. Kindness, fairness, empathetic, empathy, justice, Love, connectedness, kind of taking that some places. And then when you look at, well, and also transparency, then when you look at the competence side, you have to look at the capability and the consistency or the reliability thereof. So if these are part and parcel of the elements which is going to form and form develop the, the, the thrust, as the Prime Minister would have outlined it, then I think we are going to be in for some big paydays where transparency, accountability, and delivery becomes the all mark of the day. So working on trust, I think, is fundamental, and as I said before, foundational. And as we embark on this whole thing of dusting off the National Development Plan, it is a good time, it is a good moment to start to assess the things which we have not done so well. We could have done much better and which may be debilitators in the whole process of forging forward, of forging national growth and national development. We're going to take a break and when we come back, I look very quickly at some of the things which agencies of government may be able to do in its attempt
to, 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 to forge this trust under the four areas we mentioned. And then I'm going to make a little bit of a shift into this idea of talking about Ubuntu and how it blends into this very same idea of trust. You listen to the Essential Guardian Radio 96.9 FM. Don't move. Come right back. It's the most wonderful time of the year. Parents, it's that sweet time of year again. The kids are going back to school. So pick up your copy of the Nassau Guardian's Back to School Supplement, because it's the most wonderful time of the year. Put your students in the latest styles at the lowest prices, because Summer break is almost over, and our back to school supplement is filled with brand name back to school supplies at discounted prices, store locations, hours, and contact details. It's the happiest season of all. Advertisers, call the NASA Guardian today at 302 2300 or call your account executive to get in on the two for one insertion deal. If it's uniforms, shoes, books, Backpacks, calculators, art supplies, laptops, tablets, or whatever is on your back to school supply list, your ad should be in the Nassau Guardian's back to school supply. It's the most wonderful time of the year. The Access Accelerator Small Business Development Center is here to help small businesses throughout the entire Bahamas. To better serve you, we've made it easier to contact us. Call 461 7232. WhatsApp 3590626 or 3592394. Email helpdesk at spdcbahamas.com or submit a ticket when you visit our help center at accessaccelerator.org. The Access Accelerator, empowering small business. For the best jerk in the Bahamas, you must have Baloo's pork, fish, and chicken served with our delicious country-style sauce and authentic festivals. Baloo's, Nassau East South, call or what's up 376-8951. Baloo's, the jerk with the soul of reggae and the spirit of Junkanoo. Baloo's jerk, traditional, slow-cooked to perfection. 376-8951, get yours today. This is Guardian Radio 96.9 FM. Fresh news, smart talk, all day. And uh, welcome back. We are discussing this issue of trust. Where did this emanate from? From the Prime Minister's lecture on the National Development Plan, where he stated that, um, you know, chief amongst the things which impact governance is trust, the things which need to be resolved. And if those things are not resolved, they would likely put a break or they, are, they will result in... Uh, limitations to national development. And so we kind of went back to that. We had a discussion around it last week, but we went back to that particular aspect and tried to uh, kind of drill down into it and see how this affects the way we should understand how this idea of building trust. It's not a one-sided thing. It's not simply the, 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 the leadership doing something or the persons on the other side doing some other things. It is a two-way street. And it's fraught with the, 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 the tensions of um, perception, um, the pitfalls of perception. And so they need to be careful management. The, the idea 
of wanting to rebuild trust. I think is a I think it's an important one. I think it's uh, something which should be applauded. How we go about doing that in truth and with full fullness is going to be important. Because it's not just one single element. It's a multiplicity of elements, and these must be marshaled and curated and taken care of in a very fundamental way. So usually government delivers through its various organs, usually agencies, yeah? And so very quickly, the way the various agencies of government can help to build trust and to develop this connection, rebuild, if you wish, and to create a connection between those who are being served and those who are serving is to pay attention to those four categories we discussed earlier. Category of humanity, transparency, capability, and reliability. So how in practical terms would some of these things roll out? And these are just some examples, and I'm taking these from a document, uh, my research from Deloitte. And it speaks about quickly resolve issues with safety, security, and satisfaction, value and respect, and this is under the heading of humanity, value and respect everyone regardless of background, identity, or beliefs, value the broader good of society and the environment, not just compliance and efficiency. So you really need to be do operating in such a way that you are working for the greater good. Take care of public employees, those persons under your employ. You have to treat them right because they too are part and parcel of the overall constituents, the overall populace, the overall you know, electorate. Put structures and processes in place to manifest organizational values. So whatsoever the organization stands for, whether it's, um, it's social services or NIB or the Water Commission or Bahamas Air or BPL, whatsoever the, the service or the, the purpose, put structures and processes is in place, in place to manifest organizational values. And those values should spill over and should be experienced on an ongoing basis. And the experience of those values in action should be sufficient to drive satisfaction of those who are consuming the service. On the, the track of transparency, share information and communicate accurately and honestly. Be transparent about budgeting and funding decisions well, to the extent uh, appropriate. Be transparent about data usage and communication. Um, that is very, very important. Be clear and upfront about fees that you charge, taxes, program costs, services, and experience. People want to know, especially you're a public agency, you're using public resources, you need to be very transparent. Provide transparent and actionable leadership communication. So when things go wrong, when things go right, when things aren't going too well, whatsoever the communication is, be very transparent and actionable in what you are saying to the public, what you're saying to your constituents, what you're saying to the particular interest group or stakeholder. Capability. Perform with distinction by ensuring services and programs are good quality, accessible, and safe to use, to use, sorry. Possess the means to do what constituents expect the agency to do. So if you're in the business of delivering water, like um, the Water Commission, then you should have the ability to do so, the means to do so. And that is why it's important that these state-owned agencies can be profitable, because the extent to which they are, they are not, reduces their ability to deliver the service. So capability is not simply just in getting subventions or 
allocations from the government, but also running the organization in such a way that the capacity, the institutional capacity, the institutional competency of the organization is grown, is maintained, and is sustained. Ensure that public employees and administrators are competent and understand how to respond to constituent needs, understand how to respond to customer, understand how to respond to the public. So that's about training, it's about um, you know, sensitizing persons, it's about retraining, and doing the things which are going to get persons to be at the top of the game at all points in time. And to do so with great humanness and humanity. And then on the reliability front, consistent to deliver programs, services, and experiences with excellence. So not because you're a public agency, you're just going to do it any old how. No, you're going to deliver. You're going to be at the top of your game. You want to always be working to become best in class. And that is important. Excellence. Continually improve the quality of programs and services. So if you were doing it um, so, you know, okay last year, well, 10 years ago, and it is still kind of okay, still with no improvement, that's not what the public is expecting. That's not what constituents are expecting. You should be showing measures of improvement. And certainly, if the opposite is true, it used to be good and it continuously gets worse over time, then you really have work to do. And so the agencies in this instance must put their, must have at the forefront of um, their minds, the management, the board, the executive, must really have at the forefront of their mind what their strategic objectives are what they're called on to do, what is their purpose, what the service they're going to be delivering, and understand that they are part and parcel of the organs of overall central government, and it is through their work that the goodwill will manifest itself, really. Keep and deliver on promises. So, like, um, no, I won't use that one as an example, but, you know, whatsoever you... Whatever you say you're going to do as an agency, as an agency, then seek to keep that promise, seek to deliver on it, seek to keep, keep the service at a high level, keep the products at a high level, treat people the way they ought to be treated and operate in a way which is not going to cause you to become a burden on the society, a burden on the economy. Resolve the constituent issues in adequate and time and timely manner. So when persons call in, you know, you have a call line and persons report a problem, you know, respond to them. There is a significant amount of value to be gained by having good customer service. So not because it's a public sector entity, you know, well, we gone home, we'll check you tomorrow. No. Put systems and structure in place which is going to help persons to resolve their matters on a timely basis and also to resolve them adequately. So we're driving on the street and the road is full of potholes and then you come and you fill it and the fill is two inches above the road. Maybe timely, but not adequate. Because, you know, we're going to get the opposite of dropping in the hole. Now we're going over a mountain and that is going to have an adverse impact on vehicles anyway. So these are things which agencies, the management of agencies have to bear in mind there is a space for excellence because all of this wrap up in affecting the trust which is going to be invested in government at the end of the day. And of course, ensure data integrity and protection. Generally speaking, people give you information. You need to keep it um, private. Don't share that um, in places where they ought not to be shared, so on and so forth. And these are just simply examples. You could find any number of other things to demonstrate how we can, you know, affect the issue of humanity, transparency, capability, and reliability. Many, many others. But these are just some of the things which I would want to share this evening and we can take into consideration as we embark on this whole idea of rebuilding trust. Very, very important. 
And now I want to segue into something else, but there's a connection. Recently, I had an opportunity to speak in Florida at a function, and I delivered a speech on Ubuntu leadership. Uh, for those who would listen to me over a number of years on radio, I'm always talking about Ubuntu and Ubuntu leadership. And I want to share some, want to share that with you. Because it ties into, especially this aspect, the humanity aspect that we talked about, where it talks about how can you demonstrate empathy, kindness, and fairness. A good solid dose of Ubuntu leadership injected into the, the desires and the object as laid out by the Prime Minister, I believe is going to take us that much further and injected in government or any other organization, Ubuntu leadership have the power, the possibility, the potential to take us far, far, far from where we are because in its leadership approach, it quickly identify and arrest some of the huge negatives that we are grappling with, the lack of transparency, the lack of accountability, the lack of reliability. These are things which Ubuntu leadership automatically discourages us from doing. I listened to a presentation last night by a Toastmaster, and she put a spin on the, 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 the tagline for Nike. She said, don't just do it, live it. And this is what I am encouraging persons to do. Let's start to see how we can live our leadership out in a different way, in a way which doesn't just benefit the few, but the many, as the Prime Minister said over and repeatedly in his presentation. So let's take that first clip, Mr. Producer, as we talk about this idea of Ubuntu leadership. This is my speech, my presentation. So listen, uh, hopefully... Um, you'll enjoy it. I hope it will bring some value. My name is Hubert Edwards, and I help organizations to strategically grapple with issues of leadership, operate well, and to grow. When we think about leadership, what comes to mind? When you think about the idea of leading people, of moving them, of inspiring them, what comes to mind? Before you answer that, what does Mother Teresa and Martin Luther King have in common? What does Marcus Garvey and Mahatma Gandhi has in common? And what it is that Nelson Mandela have in common with all these persons. Whether they knew it or not, they simply were leading based on the principle of Ubuntu. Ubuntu leadership is fundamentally different from all leadership approaches for one single most important reason. You do not practice Ubuntu leadership. You have Ubuntu and you live Ubuntu. There are two very, very important approaches to leadership, which if married, gives you the greatest approximation to Ubuntu. One is transformational leadership and the other is servant leadership. Think about it. A leader who is going to be transformational, to move us from where we are, to move an organization to a place where it needs to be, to not only to do that, but to achieve what we refer to as denting the universe, way, way, way into the future. And then a leader who will take the organizational chart and turn it upside down so that he or she becomes the support 
of the entire organization, recognizing that I am not there to be served, but to serve. Ubuntu leadership is at the essence what humanity is about. There are six tenets of Ubuntu leadership. I want you to repeat these words so you remember them. Respect. Respect. Integrity. Integrity. Empathy. Empathy. Interconnectedness. Interconnectedness. Kindness. Kindness. And love. And love. Ubuntu. Ubuntu. And did I say integrity? Did I say interdependence? Did I say connectedness? What does that mean? It means that we recognize, each of us recognize, that there are absolutely no true single entity in humanity. There's no true single entity in humanity. We're all part and parcel of the same fabric. We are connected. And something there, as I was listening to that, jumps out at me again, and I'm going back. Um, you know, don't say I'm picking on the prime minister. But there's a part, a line in the prime minister's speech which speaks to this idea of servant leadership. It talks about persons who wish to practice servant leadership. Right at the very beginning, go back to the speech. A servant leader and a transformational leader in terms of the leadership style as described in theory, I believe is a great approximation to Ubuntu because you want to move people, but you also want to be there to serve them. Very, very important. Very, very important. So let's continue uh, with the next clip. Do you feel the connection there? I am. Um, the two most powerful words in the English language because everything else that comes after can be true. I am powerful. I am a leader. I am the one to change this organization. I am the one who is going to bring greatness together. But it doesn't only stop there. It gets so much more fundamental because it's recognized that in order for us to be, in order for the I am to be real, we must become. We are. And so as we look across the landscape, as we recognize this era of rock star leaders, individualism, I'm not proposing to you that you run out tomorrow and you say, okay, Ubuntu leadership is the way to go. You have to study it. You have to understand it. You have to find a way to let it seep into your system. What I'm saying to you is that Ubuntu leadership presents the ability to normalize some of the negatives that we have had in our organization. Love, respect, integrity, interdependence, connectedness. If you listen to those words, if you understand what they mean, you readily recognize that they solve in a fundamental way the vagaries, the disadvantages, the issues that we face in organizations which are not good. Governance, corporate social responsibility. So when we do our leadership, when we lead from a place where we are no longer practicing to be this type of a leader or that type of a leader, but we are living out our Ubuntu, we are living out our leadership, we are willing, like Martin Luther King, to die. We are willing, like Nelson Mandela, to spend 27 years in prison with the ability to leave but imposes one condition, when I am free, my people too ought to be free. 
When you think about a man who's going to lead a country, maybe one of the largest countries in the world, and he makes the decision, I am willing to die so that my people can be free. I am willing to die so that my people can be free. Understand what we're trying to say here. It's not about going out and live so that um, somebody can shoot you and you, you know, will be in heaven. It's the extent of the commitment. How truly are you committed to leading people to, at the end of the day, leaving them in a better place? And too often, too often, especially in the public sphere, we experience very, very, uh, you know, high, highly eloquent expositions on where we want to get with these type of things. But at the end of the day, when you look around, you still have to question, are we there yet? Too often in many organizations, in many companies, it's only a few persons who are doing extremely well. Now, they may be deserving, but some persons, other persons are also deserving, but they get left behind. How are we doing leadership? Because it goes back to this whole thing, because, you know, it, when even in an organization, this issue of trust ought to be fundamental to the growth and the development thereof. And we must remember that without the empathy, without the kindness, without the fairness, which interestingly, empathy and kindness are two of the tenets of Ubuntu leadership. Without those things, we're not going to get very far. And so the point I'm making is, and using the example of Martin Luther King, is that even though he knew that his life was in danger, he was willing to continue. Nelson Mandela, even though he was imprisoned, was restricted, he was unwilling to leave unless there was a bigger play, a play for those around him, persons who he has never met, but recognizing that he holds a key for a better day for these individuals. So let's continue to listen to it. That's what separate the regular leaders from Ubuntu leaders. I am proposing to you today, I believe this in my art. I live Ubuntu. I greet people by saying Ubuntu. And I don't do this because it's cute. Sometimes it sounds nice. Sometimes it sounds groovy because some person don't understand. It makes me sometimes feel a little bit exotic. But I do it from a place of understanding that when you pour into yourself, you have the ability to change that which is around you. So my admonition to you today is to leave from this place and to start thinking about everything that you do in your leadership walk, everything that you see from your leaders and ask yourself one important question, one important question. Ask yourself this one important question. Is the leadership sufficient, effective, capable of moving us for the greater good? Or is it designed to move only a small slice, an individual, a few persons? Because if leadership isn't done for the greater good, if leadership isn't being done for the whole, then at the end of the day, we are missing what the critical aspect of it ought to be. So I say to you, I say to you, remember this, if nothing else, just remember this, Ubuntu, I am because 
I am because we are. You are because I am. I am because we are. And the moment you believe that and live that, you understand exactly what leadership means. I want to end by flipping this whole idea on its head and to tell you that Ubuntu is an African word, actually a Zulu word. It's difficult to translate. And so we are, uh, I think we got to the, to the end too quickly. There's a middle piece, but we'll play that, Mr. Mr. Producer. Um, let's finish up this. Let's just finish up this, and then we give the middle piece um, um, and, uh, and the second go round. Means loosely humanity. Leadership which embraces humanity must be, must be, have to be the highest form of leadership there is. And so, all that's left for me to say to you whether you believe me or not, is Ubuntu. I am because we are. Thank you. Yeah, um, we kind of mix that up a little bit. So that's not all we have to say. We can go back to the middle piece. But it's important. It's important that we start to think about this whole idea. Is who, who exactly are we leading for? How many of us? So there are 10 of us in the village and uh, only two persons who keep consistently benefit from the effect of the leadership. But the village is growing. It's no longer 10, it's now 12 and then 15 and then 20, but still it's only two persons who are kind of leading or maybe now up to four or six while the village is now up to a hundred. Who exactly is it that we're leading for? In an organization, in a community, in a country, it ought to be such that it's for the greater good. More persons than not should be benefiting from the effect of the leader's effort, the leader's thinking, the leader's drive, the leader's vision, the leader's effort working together and in concert with those same said individuals. And it should be so effective, it should be so potent that if the leader should decide to go away, it's taken away, suddenly disappears. The vision, the effort, the essence of what he or she represents should be so strong, it's now embedded, become endemic into the culture of the organization, the community, the country. And that is important, the culture. How we do what we do. It requires a difference when it's not optimal. It requires a shift. And that shift, that important shift, rests squarely, 100% almost, in the hands of the undisputed leader. And that's where we have to pay attention to these things. That's where we need to focus. So as we go back to this whole idea of building trust, the extent to which persons glean or perceive to be gleaning valuable benefits from the work of the leader from the effort of those who lead, from those who are expected to deliver value, goes a far way in engendering and developing and where it was broken, help to rebuild that trust. So we have to bear that in mind. So even though we got it a little bit mixed up, let's take the middle piece, Mrs. Mr. Producer. Yeah, can we take the middle piece now? The idea of being an individual comes from the word individuum, which means I am a part of an indivisible whole. So as an individual, you're a part of me. 
I am a part of you. And what Ubuntu says to you, I am because we are recognized that you can be no better than the best of us collectively. So as an approach to leadership, we simply make the argument that you have an obligation to me to be at my best. I have an obligation recognizing that the collective cannot be at its best unless I am at my best. And therefore, we work to become our best selves. Joseph Campbell says, the caves we fail to enter holds the treasure we seek. And I'm talking about leadership, and you're asking, what does leadership have to do with cave? But here are some of the caves. Too many leaders today are about individual self. They're about being a rock star. They're about being me. They're led by this old idea of me-ism, I-ism, as opposed to us and we. And as a result, they fail to lead persons to where they need to be. The caves, love. When you love, you cherish, you move forward. When you have empathy, the ability to put yourself in my shoe, not too big, <laughs> but your ability to stand in my shoe and understand exactly what it is that I am going through makes a difference in leadership. And so when I say to you that Ubuntu leadership takes us from a place where we are not thinking about how great we are as an individual, but how great we can become as a collective. How great can we become as a collective? That right there is, to me, the crux of the matter. It's never simply about, you know, how good I am. Of course, I want to be good. Of course, I want to be great. But I mean, I have to look around brothers and sisters and, you know, friends and relatives and cousins and everyone. Is there, a, is there another place, another level that each of us can get to? But more importantly, it's a recognition that as far as you can go individually, you can go much further as a collective. Is there a last piece, Mr. Producer? Let's get the last piece before we run out of time. There's an African proverb which says, like a turtle, every man who wishes to move forward must stick his neck out. Yeah? I told you about a couple of persons earlier. Martin Luther King died at 38, 39. Nelson Mandela, 27 years in prison. Mother Teresa, the Indian lady. Ah, you missed that. She's actually not an Indian. So many people believe that she is from India, but she left her home country and went into India to take care of the poor, the underdeveloped, the struggling, that we had Mahatma Gandhi who decided, I am going to move a country, I'm going to move a people, and I'm willing to die for it. The Salt March decided, I'm not going to eat. I'm going to get to the place where if I have to starve myself to death, that is what I will have to do. What is the point I'm making here? The point I'm making here is that leaders who are transformational, leaders who can move us forward, leaders who lead with Ubuntu are willing to stick their neck out for all of us. And until and unless a leader gets to that place, nothing much happens. Just think for a moment about the worst leader you encounter in your business, in your community, in your clubs, in your country. Just think about that person for a minute. And then stop. And think about the individual who moves you 
The individual who makes you feel like a human being. The individual who brings the best out of you. That one leader who you tell your spouse, your better half, your family, anything. Anything that person asks me to do, it's done. But you see that one over there? Even if they gave me a million dollars, I'm not moving. It says to you that the ability to make the connection between you and I and to understand where we are going as a group changes life, fundamentally. And so what Ubuntu says to us, I am because we are. I want you to say that with me. I am because we are. Say that again. I am because we are. Ubuntu, we are because I am. I am because we are. I am because we are. It's very fundamental. And it's an issue which says, if I am going to be and we are going to be, then we must trust each other. And that's where I'm going to close the circle, coming right back to where we started, this whole issue of trust. I want to trust the leaders, our leaders, that they will deliver in the best interest of the greater good. And they want to be able to trust us that we will work in concert with them, hand in hand, side by side, to allow them to be able to deliver that which they believe, that which they think, that which they have reasoned out and validated as being the best course of action for us to take. And so this evening, as we talk about trust and we talk about Ubuntu, I just want you to reflect upon this and then ask yourself, what role do I have to play in this whole walk going forward. But most importantly, well, as important is how do I now view those who lead through the prism of this mechanism called trust, where we look at intent and competence, where we look at transparency and humanness, we look at capability and reliability. And in the end, we throw in this idea of Ubuntu leadership where we lead for the greater good because I am, because we are. I want to thank you for listening. We're going to leave it there as usual. We always end by saying, do not allow your greatness to become a victim of your unwillingness to change. You've been listening to The Essentials, The Reset on Guardian Radio 96.9 FM. Good night. So